J just like the airlines, um, you're in the session on managing more meds. So if, if this is not the flight you want to be on, uh, <laughs> now is the time to get off. I'm Dr. Marnie Yulberg. I'm a member of the board of directors of PHI and I'm a family physician. The, my, the co-presenter will be Dr. Alicia Foranash. She's a PharmD, which if you don't know what that means, that's a doctorate in pharmacy. The handouts, uh, her PowerPoint is in on the thumb drive. It's under the supplementary materials, and they're by the day, so it'll be on Sundays. PHI chose this topic as one of the sessions because as polio survivors in the United States, more, most of us are over 60, and there's data that shows nearly 90% of people over 60 take at least one prescription medication, and depending on the study you read, 30 to 40% of people over 60 take five or more medications, and that gets to be a challenge. Um, as a family physician, if somebody has coronary artery disease, uh, hardening of the arteries in their, to their heart muscle, routinely the cardiologists are recommending we prescribe like four different medicines. If they have had a stent placed, then there's another one or two. If they happen to have high blood pressure, which is not an uncommon combination, there's another possibly one or two. And if they also happen to have diabetes, then there's another one or two. So those three diseases, which are fairly common combination, can mean that people are taking seven or 10 more, seven to 10 medications every day. And that doesn't include diabetes, uh, diagnoses like uh, arthritis, Parkinson's, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> It's been estimated that medication reactions account for up to one-fifth of the causes of deaths in hospitals. So this can be a serious problem. The people who are great, at greatest risk for a polypharmacy, which is defined as more than four or five medications, associated medical complications are those who are taking five or more concurrent drugs, those with multiple providers that are prescribing those medications because sometimes they don't know what each of the other is prescribing. Individuals with significant medical impairments or impairments in vision or dexterity. And individuals who have recently been hospitalized. At least 25% of Americans over the age of 65 fall into one of these categories. So just Looking out on you, I can assume that about 25% of you may fall in that category. <clears throat> Dr. Fornash will talk much more about the multitude of issues that can occur with medications and have some tips about how to avoid some of these pitfalls. But I'd like to address a few. Um, one that may be an issue regarding medication that's may be particular to the polio population is for those of you who have trouble swallowing. Um, some people have trouble swallowing pills, but they can swallow capsules. Some people have trouble swallowing pills of a certain size. Um, there are some options, and particularly physicians that mostly take care of adults may not be aware of them. but. A lot of the medications come as a liquid or a chewable tablet if, if we also give the same medication to children. Um, some of them also come as dissolving tablets that you just put in your mouth and they dissolve under your tongue. Um, and there are some of the medications that come as patches, so the medicine is absorbed through your skin and you don't have to ever swallow it. As you're working with your prescriber, with your physician. Um, some of the other ways that may help you manage these medications are 
Ask your physician, do I really need this medicine? Is it possible to decrease the medicine? Is there a long-acting form so that I only have to take this medication once or twice a day instead of three or four times a day? And there are good studies that show that if you're taking a medication or a medication's prescribed four times a day, you're going to miss a number of those doses. <laughs> uh, most of us, even if we are taking antibiotics for an infection, and it's four times a day for 10 days, at the end, we usually end up with four, five, or more leftover pills. Is there a combination pill? A number of the, particularly the blood pressure medicines, come in a combination with two, two sometimes three uh, medications all in the, same, of the, in the same pill. So you can be taking one pill instead of taking two or three. Um, and then what, with multiple medications is having some system like a pill box that every week you or someone else puts the pills in the section for morning, noon, evening, uh, with meals, etc. In preparing for this talk, one of the things I hadn't thought about is I found a recommendation for a medication checkup every year, which that wasn't a big surprise. We recommend that our patients all bring do what we call a brown bag checkup, bring in all their medicines, supplements, uh, vitamins, et cetera, in a brown bag um, for us to go through and look and see what they're taking, if there's interactions. Um, but AARP recommended that, said that this is particularly important now that Medicare Part D, the plans change their formulary from year to year. So the medication that was covered on your Medicare Part D one year may not be covered next year. And so it probably makes good sense to think about doing the medication checkup, scheduling that like in October or November, since the last day that you can make a change is usually the, like December 7th or somewhere around there. I also found a website that I had not been aware of which is www.must, M-U-S-T, for seniors.org. And the must stands for Medication Use Safety Training. And now Dr. Forenash will um, talk to you about all of the good information she has. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending our presentation today. Thank you, Marnie. So um, as she mentioned, my name is Dr. Alicia Fornash. I'm a pharmacist here in St. Louis and a professor at the St. Louis College of Pharmacy. So in the United States, currently, we have over 300,000 prescription products available. In addition, there's over 10,000 over-the-counter medications available for our patients. So medication use is increasing every year for patients across the US. And not surprisingly, prescribing habits from providers are also increasing. In fact, 66% of patients are now leaving physicians' offices regularly with at least one prescription. Currently, we have in 2005, 3.4 billion prescriptions every year here in the United States. And that's a 60% increase in prescribing since 1995. With this, though, in all of these medications, 50% of patients, though, are incorrectly using their medications, and that's associated with $177 billion every year related to health costs from incorrectly taking their medications and associated disease states. So it's important that you spend time and ask questions about your medications. With all of these medications, one study found that 96% of patients didn't ask a single healthcare provider about questions about any of those medications not their provider, and not their pharmacist. So that's a high risk for those medication errors. There's a high important role for playing an active role for yourself to ask questions, as well as for your other loved ones so you have a good idea about your medications that you're using. Patients that did have good education and understanding about their medications were less likely to visit the doctors as well as have less hospitalizations because there's a lower chance of those medication errors. Additionally, we see their overall health outcomes are improved as well as their satisfaction with their health care. 
So let's take a minute here and let's have you guys participate in a true false question for me. So if you are going to the physician's office and you need to have blood work done and you need to be fasting, should you skip your morning medicines that morning? So raise your hand if it's, you, you think it's true that you should not take your medicines. Okay? How about false if you think that's the correct answer? All right, great. I love to see that everybody's participated, so thank you. <laughs> so that would be an incorrect statement. So even though you're going in to get your blood work drawn, you still need to take your medications because a lot of those medications are affecting other things, including your blood pressure. They can also check your heart rate. And it's important to know if they have you on the right dose. If you did skip that medicine, make sure you tell them you didn't take it that morning. Because if your blood pressure is high, it might end up having you get your dose increased, which might cause more side effects, or you may end up with a second prescription that you may have not necessarily needed. So best to go ahead and take your medicines that morning. When you do go to the physician's office, make sure you go in prepared. The physicians are often very busy and have only 10 to 15 minutes scheduled for you for your appointment, as well as oftentimes they're double booked several times in that hour, so their time is very busy. So go in with a list of all of the questions that you have about your health care or any specific problems or things that you want addressed so you don't forget whenever you're spending the time with the provider. Also bring in all of your medicines, and I encourage you to actually bring in your bottles every visit so they can see exactly what you have at home. Don't forget to bring in your over-the-counter medicines, so if you're taking Tylenol or ibuprofen or other things, bring those bottles as well, as well as any vitamins or any herb herbal supplementations that you're bringing, so that way they can just take a good look to make sure they have all of your listed medications and look for potential interactions. Yes? Yes, ma'am. So the question is, is if you're supposed to take all of your medications in the morning, does that include over-the-counter supplements as well as vitamins, herbals, or just prescription products? I would encourage you to take everything that you normally take so that way the doctor gets to see what you look like after your medications. The only thing to be cautious with is if there's a certain medicine you have to take with food, then that would be one to wait until after you've, you've gone home and had your breakfast. All right. Also, when you go to the provider, bring a list of all of your medications that you need to get refills on, because that will save you from having to call back later and get that refill or have your pharmacy call and you have to wait at the pharmacy to hear a response from that. If you are using a regular pharmacy here in your town and a mail order pharmacy where you get a three month supply of your medicines, make sure you know which medicines need to be written as a three month supply versus as a 30 day supply. Otherwise, if you mail off a 30 day supply to your mail order pharmacy, they're only gonna send you 30 days back. They will not call and ask for a three month supply. Whenever you visit your doctor, four out of five people any week end up taking a prescription medication. So when there is a new medication that's prescribed by your providers, oftentimes patients aren't given information by their providers. 25% of the time, patients are told what the name of the new prescription product is. Only 35% of the time is the patient told about side effects. And when that is brought up, most often it's only about serious side effects. So it's not gonna tell you the common things that you're ex most likely gonna experience at home. Only 33% of patients are told how long that they'll be on that medication. So is this a short course for a couple weeks to kind of take care of your concern? Or is this now a chronic or a regular medicine that you're gonna be taking lifelong? When these medications are given, only 50% of the time are the patients told the dose and how to take those medications. So there's, again, there's a lot of air for opportunity here. Oftentimes with all of these different products, we're given samples by our providers as well to try out the meds to see if they work. Remember, when you get a sample from your physician, you're not getting a label that tells you how much to take or how often to take it or side effects that you're gonna see like you would from the pharmacy. So if you do receive samples for a new medication, make sure you especially ask questions and get an idea of exactly how long you're supposed to take this medicine and how many times per day. So another true-false question, so pharmacists are required by law to educate patients about their medications. So raise your hand if you think that's true. Okay, how about raise your hand if you think that's false? 
All right, so we got a good mix of responses here in the audience. This is actually true. There is a law called OGRA 90 that required pharmacists starting in 1993 to offer prescription education on all medications, both new prescriptions as well as refills. And we'll talk just a little bit more about that in two slides. So when you go to the pharmacy, get to know your pharmacist. We are here to help you. We love to talk with people about their medicines. Yes, the pharmacist sometimes looks busy behind the counter, but please take the time to get to know your pharmacist. One study found that only 35% of patients knew the name of their pharmacist, which is a problem. Because if you don't know your pharmacist, you don't establish that relationship and you don't always look to them as a healthcare provider. When you do know your pharmacist, you're more likely to tell them about all of the medications that you're taking, including those over-the-counter medications and vitamins and herbal supplementations. You're also more likely to completely read the label and make sure you understand the medication. You're also more likely to know the ingredients of the medications that you're taking and ask more questions related to your health. So that law again is called OBRA 90 and it requires all pharmacists to provide education on every prescription in the pharmacy. However, most of the time pharmacists or pharmacy technicians don't always let you know that that's your right to ask questions. You know when you pick up your prescription they have you sign the form. Sometimes they ask at that point if you have questions for your pharmacist, but when you sign that form it does two things. One, it verifies for insurance that you picked up your medication, but two, it's also saying that you've had the offer for education and you declined it at that time. So make sure if you have questions, stop and ask and talk to your pharmacist. Yes, sir. Sure. So the good question, so the question is, is if you are using a drive through pharmacy, does the, how do you ask questions at that point, and does the leaflet that comes with it count as your education? So it's not required that they have to give you those leaflets, most pharmacies do, simply because that's what everybody else down the street is, and that way again, they've at least provided some type of education. But if you've ever spent much time looking at the leaflets, they're overwhelming. They provide way too much information, they're often scary when you read them, and they're written at such a high level that it almost takes a medical degree to read them and completely understand what's going on. I understand, especially with busyness or trouble getting around, that you know, using a drive through pharmacy makes it easier. But you can ask questions with that button there. The other is call back, and they'll be happy to talk with you over the phone. If you do have questions for your pharmacist, or if the pharmacist stops to give you education before you leave, take the time to listen. You know, don't be in that big of a hurry that you can't take a few minutes to learn more about your medications. Bottom line is if you have a pharmacist that is not educating and taking the time to get to know you and ask questions, or if, you're not ask, if you ask them questions but they make you wake a long time to actually see the pharmacist, you need to go to a new pharmacy. You deserve good health care from your pharmacist and from your pharmacy, and if you're not getting it, then you need to go somewhere else. When you do go to a pharmacy, I encourage you to only use one pharmacy. That way they get a complete list of your medications and they can look better for those drug interactions. It's also important too, you let them know over the counters and vitamins and herbal supplements that you're using. When you have insurance, your cost that you're, you're paying for your prescriptions is set by your insurance company. It's not set by the pharmacy. So going to three pharmacies and price shopping isn't necessarily gonna help you out. You know, if you're paying cash for all of your medications and you don't have insurance coverage, you know, then it's gonna be a little bit more challenging to find the cheapest pharmacy, but please pick one so you get the best education or best understanding for your medications. When you do call for refills, call before you run out. Most insurance companies will let the pharmacy process for new refills three to seven days before your prescription runs out. So let them know. So if they are super busy, that you don't have to stand there and wait for 20 or 30 minutes for it to get ready. It's ready when you get ready to come in and pick it up. 
Good way to do is just set reminders on your calendar. So if you use a paper calendar, put an M or put an R on there when it's time for refill of your medications. If you have an email calendar or a phone calendar, you can set that up to automatically pop up once a month as well to remind you to call and get refills before you run out. When you do get education about your medications, I always provide my education by purpose, so what you're gonna take this medication for, proper use, so how should you take this at home? Does it um, need to be taken with or without food? Does it need to be taken in the morning or the evening? So you have a good, under and good understanding of how to use the medication. And finally, I always educate about potential side effects, so common things that you'll see with the medications as well as those rare risks that you may be at risk for as well. Ask about for those new prescriptions about drug interactions with your other medications or with food interactions, particularly your over-the-counters or grapefruit juice, whether or not you can have that. And we'll talk a little bit more about food interactions in a few slides. You also want to be careful with meds that look alike or sound alike to decrease the risk of your medication errors. With all of those prescription products available in the United States, it's easy for things to get confused. When you get education from the pharmacy about the prescription, so if you're going to be picking up a new medication and it's supposed to be for diabetes, but instead they're educating you about a medication that's going to be an antibiotic, you know that you're not going to be getting the right product. So that's another role that education can help reduce your risk of having drug interactions or in incorrect medication errors. When you're at the pharmacy, particularly with your over-the-counter medications, read the ingredients on the label. We often have, with all of these products out there, the same brand name of a product, but they have different ingredients. So for example, one medication called Unisom, it's a medicine that use, helps people fall asleep. There are two different ingredients or formulations of Unisom on the market. One of them contains diphenhydramine, which is the same thing as Benadryl. The other one contains doxylamine, which has been the traditional Unisom formulation. If you were having allergy problems and already taking Benadryl or diphenhydramine, if you added this product on top, you'd end up doubling the dose of that diphenhydramine that you'd be receiving. Another example is Correctol, which is used as a um, medication to help with constipation. There's two formulations of that as well. One of them is a stool softener form called Colace or Docusate, and there's another form that's called um, Bisacodal, which is going to be more of a stimulant laxative and cause more of a quicker reaction for the stools. And again, it's important that you look to make sure you're not having a second product with that same ingredient to make sure you're not going to duplicate your medications. As for herbal ingredients, 40% of the United States has tried at least one alternative or herbal medication therapy. Unfortunately, with the herbal medications, we don't know much about them. Oftentimes, people will take these instead of prescription products because they believe that they're going to be safer, but they're not any safer at this point. In fact, we have very limited clinical trials to look at drug interactions, side effects, contraindications, so it's very unsure with a lot of the information with herbals. If you are going to take an herbal medication, make sure you let your providers know, but also make sure you look for a product with this label on the, on the bottle, that USP. That guarantees that your product has been made in a clean environment. It also says that the ingredients in the bottle are the strength that they're supposed to be. There have been samples of herbal medications where they found anywhere from 3% of the listed dose up to 300% of the listed dose on that bottle. And that's even from the same manufacturer having that much variability with their products. Also without that USP label, they could be made anywhere, including someone's home or their garage or their business, and it doesn't mean it's been a clean environment. So if you are purchasing herbal products, make sure you get the USP label to make sure it's gonna be a safe product for you. When you have questions about your medications, good things to know about all of your medications is know what is that medication for? How long do I continue it? So is it, again, a short-term medicine, or is it something you're going to take a long time? How or when should I start to feel better? Traditionally, with an antibiotic, you'll start to feel better in about two, or two days or so. But if you're taking a medication for depression, that often takes four to six weeks before you feel better. And it's important to know if you're going to start feeling, when to start feeling better, because if you don't feel better, you might stop it before you get to that point. 
What side effects should you watch for? And then if you do experience these side effects, what do you do? Do you discontinue the drug? Do you tolerate it? Do you call and let us know and get a dose change? Ask to know how to manage those side effects. When should you take the medications? Do you take it with or without food? Does it have special administration? Does it need to be 30 minutes before a meal and stay sitting up or standing up for at least 30 minutes afterwards, like we see with some of our osteoporosis medications? Can you drink alcohol with the medication? You know, some medications have very severe interactions if you take alcohol with them at the same time. How do you handle a missed dose? You know, most of the time with missed doses, as soon as you remember, go ahead and take that medicine. But if it's been more than a couple hours, then you wait until the next dosing period. And also, what do you do with your current medication? Is this a replacement medication and you stop something else? Or is this a medication that's now an additional medication for you? So medication list, I encourage everyone to carry around a medication list. So in case of an emergency, or if a provi healthcare provider asks what meds you are and you can't remember everything, you've got a list of those medicines. This is an example of medication lists that I provide for my patients. So since all of your medications have two names on them, the brand and the generic names, I list both of them so then there's no confusion. What strength, so what size tablet are you getting for that? And how often do you take it in the day? Morning, afternoon, evening, and then directions like you'd see on the bottle plus what that medication is for. Know your medications. Since each of these medications have a brand and generic name, it's a good idea to know what both of those medication names are. For example, some of our over-the-counter medications, you know, we have ibuprofen, but that's also known by the brand names of Motrin and Advil. Well, ibuprofen can be put in a bunch of other products. If you were having some pain or a headache and you took Motrin or Advil, again, you have to be careful that you don't double up on that dosage. There was another um, side effect story where a patient um, was taking medications. He was wanting to stop smoking, and he also had some depression. So he went to two of his doctors and told them about his mood, and he also told them he was interested in stopping smoking. Well, there's a medication known as the generic name of bupropion, but it has two brand names. One, Zyban, to help people stop smoking, and the other is called uh, um, Wellbutrin for depression. Well, this, this patient ended up getting samples from one of the providers for the antidepressant known as the Wellbutrin. The other provider gave the patient a prescription for the generic product, Bupropion. The patient took that prescription to the pharmacy and filled it. He didn't tell his pharmacist that he had also received samples of this other medication. So he ended up taking two of the same medications, doubled his dose, and he ended up having a seizure because he received too much of that medication. So it's really important to know all of your names. If you don't know, ask your pharmacist or ask for a list of both names of your medications to help prevent that from reacting. As for your brand names and generic name medications, they are equally effective. The FDA requires that all of the medications have, would be within about a 5% range of the brand name product to get approved as the generic. So they will have the same effects in your system. Um, also know what your medication looks like. You know, so when you go to the pharmacy and you look, come home and you look at your bottle, make sure it looks like the same product that you've been receiving before. If it's a different brand or your pharmacy gets a different man, uh, manufacturer and so your product looks different, a lot of times they'll put a sticker on your bottle to tell you it looks different than before. If they don't, call and ask to make sure you've got the right product. Also, if you have trouble swallowing some of your medications, as Marnie has mentioned, before you crush or you break your tablets, ask first. Several medications cannot be crushed or broken. Follow the directions of your medications. So don't double the dose because you think you need more. Don't cut them in half because you're doing well or to save money, and don't skip doses on purpose. My grandma was classic with cutting things in half. As soon as her <laughs> blood pressure was controlled, she cut her medicine in half because she was doing great. Or as soon as her cholesterol was controlled, she'd take it every other day because she was doing great. Don't give other people your medications as well because of the drug interactions, the side effects that can occur. These are meant for you and your family member or your friend may have a serious reaction from taking your medications. On the same token, don't take other people's medications just because you ran out. 
If you do take antibiotics, I just want to make a note of caution. Most infections that people have end up being just viral infections. So if you give an antibiotic, it will not take in or do anything for that virus. It has to be a bacterial type infection. So when you have a head cold, oftentimes it takes 10 to 14 days before that turns into a bacterial infection. And most of the times people are feeling better from that virus at that time. So don't push your provider to give you antibiotics for every cold that you're having. If you are given antibiotics, please finish them. Resistance of antibiotics is on the rise across the United States. So let's say you're given a 10-day supply of an antibiotic. If you only take six days worth it, if those bacteria that are still around keep living, those are the ones that have already survived that antibiotic. So if your infection comes back and you need a second antibiotic, they're going to be resistant to that first one, and it's going to be harder to get rid of. You're going to have to have stronger antibiotics that are harder on your system and harder to get rid of that infection. Remember to take your medicines on a regular routine. So establish a routine. So first thing in the morning, you get up, you eat your breakfast, you have your medications, and that's your plan. Or at night, if you're taking a medication, you brush your teeth, then you take your medicines, and you head to bed. So it's part of just your regular routine. And that'll help reduce your risk for missed doses. Use a reminder system. It's tough to keep track of some of your medicines, especially when you have busy days. You might get an hour or so into your schedule and can't remember if you took them or not. A great way to help keep track of them is use pill boxes, because then you can easily lift the lid and see if your medications are still there or not. Or put a reminder on your calendar, so every day after you take your medicine, put an M on that day so you know that you took your medications. Or set a reminder on your email or on your phone. I particularly like to use the phone reminders if you're taking a medication that other than first thing in the morning. If you have side effects with your medications, talk with your doctors. So that way they can either try to reduce your dose, give you a way to help reduce that side effect, or switch you to a different medication so you're not suffering. If you have concerns about your medications, whether it's something you've heard on TV, something you've read about, or something you're just concerned about, stop and ask so they can address those for you. If you have cost-related issues for your medications, there are programs out there to help you with medication costs. They're called per, um, patient assistance programs. These are meant for low-income folks, so typically incomes of less than $16,000 a year for singles or about $24,000 a year for a family. With that, you generally have to have no insurance, or if you have Medicare, you need to be in the donut hole at that point. But you would fill out an application, your provider would sign for it, give you a new prescription, mail that in, and see if you get approved. If you're approved, they will often send you three months of that medication at no cost or very low cost to help you out. You can get more information on patient assistance programs at this website, www.needymeds.com. So medication and food drug interactions. So be careful with these. When you have other foods or beverages, they can do several things. They can either prevent your medication from working, they can cause you to develop a new side effect, or if you have a side effect, sometimes they make that side effect better because they reduce the levels of that medication. When you take these medications, know whether or not they can be taken with food or after you get done eating, or if they need to be on an empty stomach so you get the best results from those medications. Some medications are required that they're taken with a low-fat meal, so that's important to know before you take that medication. So some interactions to be careful about with alcohol. Those include antihistamines, so like our Claritin, our Benadryl, like diphenhydramine, acetaminophen products, narcotic pain medications, metronidazole, benzodiazepines like lorazepam, Ativan, um, alprazolam, um, antidepressant medications, so like so, uh, citalopram or Celexa, um, venlafaxine or Effexor, or fluoxetine or Prozac, those medications are antipsychotic medications like Abilify, Seroquel, um, Geodon, or some of our sleep aids as well. Most of the time when you combine medications with alcohol, you're going to get more sedation, more drowsiness, more weakness with the medications. But sometimes the reactions can be severe. With Tylenol, if you take that at the same time as your alcohol or even after your alcohol, that can cause more risk for liver damage. One in particular, metronidazole or flagyl, it's an antibiotic, that if you take that with alcohol, even a cough syrup that has alcohol, it will cause you to get violently sick, lots of vomiting, lots of retching, and so it's very important that that medication is avoided with any alcohol. 
There's other medications that's important to separate these with food because otherwise you can get a binding of it and you don't actually absorb the medications. So digoxin, that medication is a heart medication and it needs to be taken either one hour before you eat or at least two hours after you eat. Levothyroxine, a thyroid medicine, needs to be taken first thing in the morning. Fluoroquinolone, some of our antibiotics like ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, those are going to be binding with food if you're not careful or certain types of food. Um, some other antibiotics, tetracycline, minocycline, doxycycline, those as well have to be separated from dairy products or your multivitamin. Some of our antifungal medications like ketoconazole or itraconazole have to be taken away from food. And our bisphosphonates, so alendronate, uh, resedronate, ibandronate, um, boniva, those have to be taken first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. So make sure if you're you know these pieces about your medications. We have other specific medication interactions as well. So warfarin or coumadin, that can bind up with our vitamin K foods, so our green leafy vegetables. Not that you can't have these foods, but it's important here that you have a balanced or a consistent amount every week. If you're on an MAOI inhibitor like phenylzine or transcyclopromine or linazolid, which is an antibiotic, these interact with tyramine-containing foods. So if you ever watch Silence of the Lamb, this is like Hannibal Lecter's diet, Chianti wine, aged cheeses, beer, aged meat, um, organ meats like liver. If you combine these with these medications, it can skyrocket your blood pressure and cause problems. Caffeine can interact with some of our asthma medicines like albuterol um, or theophylline because those medicines are actually metabolized into a form of caffeine. You're going to get more increased blood pressure, increased heart rate. You might feel your heart's pounding. Or if you take ca caffeine products with blood pressure medicines or heart medicines, that's going to raise your blood pressure and do the opposite effect of those medications. If you're on blood pressure medicines like an ACE inhibitor, so lisinopril, enalapril, captopril, or if you're on an ARB, so losartan, um, benazapril, those medications, those can actually interact with potassium-containing foods. Or if you use a salt substitute, that's got potassium in it, and you have to be careful because that can raise your potassium levels. Another common food and drug interaction is with our grapefruit products. So as little as seven ounces, so less than one measuring cup, can cause interactions with grapefruit. But besides grapefruit, limes, so only two ounces of lime juice can have the same interaction. Pumelos, which is kind of like a large grapefruit but green, has the interaction. Or Seville oranges, which is common, commonly used as the orange and orange marmalade jelly. These medications inhibit some of the, or stop the enzymes that break down some of your medications in your body from happening. So your drug levels get very high and increase the risk for your side effects. There are lots and lots of medications that interact with these fruits. I'm not going to read you this list, nor is this a 100% complete list because there's so many. A few things to think about if you're on a, a cholesterol medication, a statin, so like a torvastatin or Lipitor. If you take Crestor or a, tor, um, a Crestor, Fluvastatin, Pravastatin, those all interact with these, the grapefruit juice. And you'll get more chance for muscle pain or muscle aches if you take these at the same time. These, these um, citrus products interact with these enzymes in your body, not for just a couple hours. So it's not like you can have that in the morning and take your other medication later in the day. These can affect those enzyme systems for 24 hours. So it's not like you can take a break and still have these products. So let's get back to another true false question. You can store your medications in the medicine cabinet in your bathroom. Raise your hand if that's true. Okay. Raise your hand if you think that's false. All right, so again, we've got a good mix of answers here from the audience. This is false. It is a missed name cabinet. So let's call, call it instead our cosmetic cabinet in the bathroom rather than our medication cabinet. It's important to store your medications in the correct places. You're looking for a cool, dry area. So keeping them in the bathroom or even in the kitchen, if it's near your stove or your oven, can get cause excess moisture, excess heat, and break down your medicines so they stop working even quicker. It's important that anywhere that you store medications that you keep them out of the reach of children and pets to keep everybody else in the household safe. Excuse me. 
Consider locking up several of your other prescription products just because abuse of prescription products is on the rise across the country. So whether somebody's coming over to visit, family, friends, it's just a good idea to keep any risky meds out of their reach. So prescription painkillers, so our opioid um, like Narco, um, Vicodin, Percocet, Oxycodone, those medications are on the abuse rise. Anxiety meds, those benzodiazepines, lorazepam, Ativan, um, Alprazolam, those those medicines are getting abused. Some of the ADHD meds that kids take, so like Ritalin, uh, methylphenidate, those medications are getting abused, as well as even prescription sleep aids um, get abused as well. So those are just good things to keep out of the reach of other people. So true or false, every household should have a bottle of Ipecac available. Raise your hand if it's true. Okay. Raise your hand if it's false. No one took false. It is false. So as for poison prevention, there's a rise of poison prevention across the United States. 87 people die every day because of accidental poisonings, whether that's prescription products, chemicals, uh, other things around the household, but that's an astonishing number of patients. Also, specifically, prescription accidental intakes is related to 60,000 ER visits every year for children. So it's important that we keep our medications out of the reach. Not even just our medicines, but other household chemicals, cleaners, everything out of the reach of children and pets. It's important to realize that your medication bottles are child resistant. They're not child proof. So the only thing is they're supposed to slow, you de slow the child down long enough that you can see them with that bottle. It will not prevent them from getting into the product. Good ways to help reduce that risk of accidental poisonings, especially with children, is never call medicine candy, because they're gonna think that's a treat and they're gonna wanna take the medicine other times. Often many medications look like candy, so it's important that they don't get confused. Keep your medications in the original container. Everybody's probably guilty of keeping in their pocket or in their purse a little pill container. And so those can, when we mix several of our medications, we don't know how old they are, we don't know exactly what it is, and if your grandchild or another kid would get into your purse and accidentally take those medicines, we don't know exactly what they've taken. Keep the poison control number handy, just in case there is an accidental question. If they're available all across the U.S., they'll call you back, they'll check on you to make sure everything's okay. I also encourage you to use the Mr. Yuck stickers, which is the green upside down face, and keep that near your chemicals or around your household medicines. Put that on the door or the cabinet or wherever you keep your medications to know that that's not a good place for kids to be going. Look at your household plants, both indoor and outdoor. Some of our plants are just as pretty as they are poisonous, and it's important that we know which ones those are. And then finally, don't use the Ipecac solution anymore. For many years, everybody was encouraged to keep the Ipecac available, so in case there was a poisoning, you'd have people vomit it back up and you would keep them safe. Unfortunately, with the rise of eating disorders, there are people that have been abusing Ipecac to force themselves to vomit. Additionally, research has shown that when you did give patients Ipecac or not give them Ipecac, the outcome was still the same, and it didn't reduce any death or poisoning-related issues. Additionally, if somebody took a chemical down that was burning or caustic, when they vomited it back up, it caused more damage in the GI tract. So instead, you're best to take them to the ER. They'll give them activated charcoal or they'll like pump their stomach and get the product out that way. As Marnie has mentioned, I encourage everybody to get a medication checkup at least once a year. And in fact, pharmacists offer what's called medication therapy management. Many insurance companies will even pay for your pharmacist to sit down and talk with you about your medication so that way they get benefit of not just, that way they're not losing time with other people. At this medication therapy management review, talk with your doctor, review what everything is for, review how effective the different therapies are, look for the drug interactions between your medications, your over-the-counters, your herbals, your vitamins products, and talk about side effects or concerns that you may be having. At the same time, I encourage you to look for expired medications as well in your cabinet and get rid of those products. 
When you do, do talk with some of your, your pharmacists or your providers about your medications, things to be particularly cautious about for our polio surviving um, patients is things that are going to cause more weakness, things that are going to cause more fatigue, or increase your risk of falling. So make sure you're asking your providers about these things. But if you have a medication on board that may cause one of these risks, don't stop taking it without talking to your provider first. There's a reason that they put that on board for you. You need to address that concern with them before you stop taking it. Certain medications to be particularly cautious of because of these, these side effects include some of our non-selective alpha blockers. So terazosin, doxazosin, these are medications that are commonly used in men for enlarged prostates. So just be cautious because you can get some more dizziness with these products. Some of our benzodiazepines, so lorazepam or alprazolam, they can cause more sedation or more tiredness, some weakness with them. Some of our muscle relaxers, carisolpidol, methylcarbinol, um, those products, so make sure again you talk to your doctor before you stop them. Some of our opioid pain medications, so hydrocodone, which is found in Norco or Vicodin, codeine products, oxycodone, which is found in Percocet, uh, ask about those medications. Or some of your typical antipsychotics, so promethazine, which can be used for psychiatric conditions or for nausea and vomiting, thorazine, haloperidol, ask about those medicines before or you discontinue. So another true, true false question. So when you find an expired medication, you should flush them down the toilet. Raise your hand if that's true. No takers? All right, how about false? All right, I love it. No one took the true. So that is false. <laughs> So the cat litter bags. So let's talk about how we're going to get rid of our medicines in just one second. So if you do find expired medications, do not continue using them. They do often become less effective, or they might increase the risk of side effects. Aspirin's a particular product that's going to cause a lot more GI upset, so nausea, upset stomach if you continue taking it when it's expired. Other medications may actually harm you if you take them expired. So tetracycline is an antibiotic that can cause kidney problems if you take it when when it's old. You also have several medications that may expire before the expiration date on the actual product. Insulin is an example of that. Once you start using an insulin pen or a vial, it's good for 30 days, inside or outside the refrigerator. The only exception is Levomir, and that's good for six weeks outside of the refrigerator. After that, it loses its effectiveness and you're not going to get the benefit. Many of our inhalers, so if you use an albuterol form called Ventolin, which is a blue inhaler, it expires six months after it's been removed from the foil package. Our Advair discus, discus those purple inhalers used for asthma or COPD, those medications expire 30 days after you take them out from the foil package. So I always encourage on those products to take a marker and mark on there when they expire so you don't forget. When you do have your medications, do not flush them. Luckily, everybody knows that already here in the audience, which is fabulous. But important to take them out of the original container and then mix them with undesirable things. So exactly, like the kitty litter you've talked about, coffee grounds. Put those in a sturdy container, mix them with those undesirable products, and then put the lid back on them. So an empty can, you could use a plain box, you can use even a sealable bag. And then throw them in the trash right before you take your trash out to the curb. Patches, oftentimes the best way to get rid of those is stick them back to themselves and then put them with those undesirable things. When you're traveling with your medications, make sure you bring a list of all of your medications as well as have the name of your pharmacy and all of your providers in case of an emergency. If you accidentally do forget one of your medications, most of your medications can get transferred from one pharmacy to another pharmacy at no cost or no problems for you. If you're going to be taking, like, let's say, a, a winter holiday or you're going to be gone for several weeks at a time and you're going to miss a refill, your pharmacy can do a vacation request for you, which means they'll fill it early, but then your, your refill on after that needs to be back at its regular time. Of course, when you're traveling, keep your medications in the original container, so that way if security needs to look at it, it's got your name on it and it's got exactly what it is. 
Don't leave your medications in a car with the really cold temperatures in the winter or our really warm temperatures here in the summer. That can break down your medicines and make them less effective. So you're best to keep them with you. If you're traveling on an airline, keep those in your carry-on bag. So again, they don't have extremes in temperature or pressure, but it also will help keep everything safe with you in case your luggage gets lost. Um, also, sometimes on the airlines, you will need to have a special note from your provider that says these medicines or supplies need to go with you. Oftentimes, insulin, so the needles, or your diabetic testing supplies may require a physician's note saying it's okay for you to have these on board. Other things to just help you keep you in good health is stay up to date on preventative medications. So keep up on your vaccines. So everybody should receive a flu vaccine every year, as well as everybody should get a booster of their tetanus providing. So within the last about eight years, the new form of tetanus out there contains pertussis, which protects against whooping cough. If you've not had this booster within the last eight years or so, you should talk with your provider to see if you should get this. Everyone should get this once as an adult. And in fact, it's so important, every pregnant patient has to get it in every pregnancy. Also, we recommend for everyone over the age of 65 or with certain health conditions to get a pneumonia vaccine, um, get a hepatitis A, hepatitis B vaccine, or get a Zostavax to help prevent against shingles outbreaks. Other screenings to keep up on your health to check up and prevent other problems is get your women, get your pap and pelvic exams, your mammograms done regularly. For men, get your prostate checked. And for everyone to make sure you're up to date on getting colonoscopies to look for colon cancer. One of my favorite things to make sure everybody's getting plenty of is calcium and vitamin D to help prevent against uh, bone loss. If it's needed, if you have a history of heart disease, get an aspirin, or if your doctor think that, thinks that that's an important thing for you. And many, many patients as well need to have cholesterol medicines like the statins, atorvastatin, um, pravastatin, fluvastatin on board as well. So let's take a minute and let's think about our calcium intake to make sure you're getting enough from your diet. So the three things that we get most concerned about is gonna be our milk, cheese, and yogurt intake. So take a second and think about how many glasses of milk do you have every day? Well, I typically drink about two cups of milk. So each cup gets you about 300 milligrams. So I get about 600 milligrams of calcium every day from my milk. How many cups of yogurt do you eat every day? Well, I don't eat it every day, so it's an occasional. When it's an occasional, you get to count that as a zero. How about cheese? How many one ounce slices or servings of cheese do you have? So if you have pre-packed cheese or deli sliced cheese, often it's a slice and a half. If you, drink, if you have sl uh, string cheese, it's one of those string cheese packets. Or if you have shredded cheese, it's about a fourth of a cup, so a good handful of that. So how many times every day do you have your, your cheese? Well, I typically have that occasionally, so that also gets me a zero. So total from my diet, I get about 600 milligrams of calcium every day. And as long as you're eating a well-balanced diet and getting good intake, you also get about a bonus of 200 milligrams of calcium from your other foods in your day. So I typically get about 800 milligrams of calcium. So how much does everybody need? In general, if you're under the age of 50, you need about 1,000 milligrams of calcium every day. If you're over 50, you need 1,200 milligrams of calcium every day. Why calcium is so important is if you don't get enough calcium, you actually steal it from your bones every day, just a little bit to keep your blood levels normal. And every day when you pull a little bit out of that, that increases your risk of osteoporosis or breaking your bones easier as we age. So before you start a calcium regimen, make sure you talk with your healthcare provider to make sure everything else is in check, but make sure that's one thing that you address with your providers. So again, make sure you remember your calcium. One of my favorite forms of calcium is Viactive. They're a candy calcium chew. They come in caramel, chocolate, chocolate mint, strawberry, vanilla, raspberry, and orange, and they're a great way to take it in. To me, I use them every day, and it's kind of like a little dessert after I get done eating my meal. There's lots of other calcium supplements available that can give you about five or 600 milligrams of calcium with each of those tablets. But again, check with your doctor before starting a calcium product. I've also provided here for you a list of various references that you have for other medication safety or medication use tips that you can go to if you have questions. Otherwise, at this time, we would be happy to help answer any questions that you might have.
there there are slips to write them on but since it's a small enough group if you want to just shout them out that'd be fine too So the question is, if you're taking a statin for cholesterol medications, is it common to have the muscle pains with them, and are there other alternatives? So yes, there are several different statins available on the market, and you might find that one will to you'll tolerate better than others. There are certain products that have more muscle pain associated with them compared to others. So that would be a great opportunity to talk with your doctor about that side effect. They may check a lab level as well at the same time to make sure that nothing serious is happening. Um, and then at that point, try a different one for you. And, and I, I would add to that, um, there has been a real concern about statins in the post-polio population and because you know we don't want to lose any more strength, et cetera. Um, we used to have a monthly conference call of the post-polio clinic directors and among ourselves talking about it none of us saw that happening any more often than it does in the general population but of course it has more impact in the polio population so I mean I have some patients who refuse to take any statins but are diabetic and have high blood pressure and are really at risk and you know a heart attack will kill you <laughs> post-polio doesn't but um, when your doctor checks the, the blood test, which is usually a CPK or creatine kinase, mm -hmm. a lot of polio survivors have a, an elevated level of CK. Normal is like 100, up to 150, maybe 200, depending on the lab test. A lot of polio survivors, their baseline will be 300 or 400. So it'd be really nice to know what yours was before it started. Mm -hmm. But if it's much higher than that. You stop the statin and then get the blood rechecked and it's lower, but still not back down to normal. It may just be that that was your baseline. Is it possible to get the same benefits of statins by just controlling one's diet? It depends. Um, about 15% of people, the cholesterol is related to their diet. Most of the rest of us, it's, it's really genetic. <laughs> and so it's worth a try, certainly, in terms of diet. And then there also are some other options sometimes of some of the fish oils, et cetera. The other thing to think of, too, is in, if you have fat buildup or plaques in your arteries, the statins not only lower your cholesterol, they actually can stabilize those plaques and shrink them so they're less likely to break off and cause heart disease. So they do a lot in your body besides just lower the cholesterol. Okay, the question was that this woman had uh, an adverse reaction to the pneumonia shot with um, increased leg pain and cold intolerance um, and was told by the nurse that a number of people with neurologic problems 
have that reaction to the pneumonia shot. That's not been my experience. Um, and I mean, just personal experience, I, I had the pneumonia shot when I turned 65 and I didn't have any symptoms. And most of my post polio patients haven't reported that problem. But, you know, everybody is unique and things can happen. The pneumonia. No, the pneumonia shot. Lay in the green. Yeah, it's getting back to the cholesterol, and I finally found the one I can tolerate, but it's still causing this little muscle problem, and it's not really lowering the cholesterol. It's still about 250, and I eat a very low-fat diet. Yeah. Should you just put up with this small amount of pain for some possible benefit? I've tried about five or six, and they're giving me I have a high tolerance, and they, they just, I can't even walk anymore. Okay. So, so the question was, uh, I have tried a, a number of cholesterol medicines and still having side effects, and should she just tolerate the side effects? You really need to discuss that with your provider in terms of looking at how serious the risk is um, in terms of your risk of a heart attack or stroke. There, there are some people who shouldn't take them, but, but you have to weigh the risk. I mean, it's like anything, weighing the benefit and the risk. And, there's, and because that muscle pain can be a problem, there is some research that's being done on not taking a statin every day to see if they still get the benefits without having some of the side effects. Um, we don't have exact, there's, I know of a couple small studies with that at this point, but again, as Marnie's explained, that would be a better question for your, your provider. Rocky. Is there a, an easy way to find out interactions with uh, over-the-counter, especially supplements and grapefruit, for instance, to a, a different drug that you, you, you prescribe for, uh, rather than reading that long list, <laughs> which is, the, you know, it's got some of that in there, side effects, but is there a So the question is, is there a good place for patients to look up information about drug interactions, food interactions, grapefruit juice interactions, without having to read through the lengthy prescription leaflet? So my first suggestion would be, was just, it's just ask your pharmacist. You know, they've got very quick access. If they don't know off the top of their head, they can put it in their computer system and they'll know immediately to be able to answer that for you. As for food interactions, the FDA actually has a web page where they've listed a lot of specific interactions. And if you go to the slide deck, it is the reference I've used for some of the, um, the medication and food interaction safety. And they list many of the drug interactions with food as well as some of the grapefruit interactions as well. Um, there are some other web pages offhand um, that can look that up. The ones I'm most familiar with are ones that re you require a subscription fee to use. I'm not sure if you know off hand a good drug interaction checker for for low no cost <laughs> now fortunately um, where I still work part-time uh, we have a farm D so we just always ask Nancy <laughs> but one of the other things I'd like to mention about interactions is almost all the studies on interactions have only been comparing two things so this blood pressure medicine and this diabetes medicine or whatever because it's very difficult to do a study looking at the interactions of five medicines and how they all work together. So we really don't know. So we really don't know more than about two with certain things. So the question is, is what about taking omega-3 supplements? Um, so the, 
thinking about some of the like fish oil or omega-3 supplements that are available, we have to be careful what the source is for those. Some of the omega-3 and fish oil supplements are coming from some natural fish soy, uh, sources and they've been linked to high mercury content. And so that's a concern with many of the products that are available out there. There are some omega-3 supplements that are available as a prescription. Unfortunately, it raises the cost quite a bit when you switch to that product, but it is made more from a synthetic product and you take out that risk for the mercury toxicity. So the question is, is if you um, have trouble swallowing and you don't eat much fish, should you be taking an extra omega-3 supplement? Some of the most recent clinical trial information that I'm familiar with hasn't shown much benefit with taking omega-3 supplements for cholesterol type purposes. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be harmful for you to take it if you're looking, you know, depending on what you're looking for it for. Again, you have to be careful on the mercury comp uh, component. Personally, I don't think that's a supplement that you would need to take. Do you have thoughts? The, there, there's been a lot of varying research results in the last year or so about whether, how beneficial omega-3s are or are not, particularly the supplements. So the question is, is whether it's better to take the omega-3 fish oil supplement versus the flaxseed oil supplement. Um, it kind of depends. What is your purpose of taking it? Is it for cholesterol? Uh, can, can I ask what the indication or the reason is? So okay, so the reason is then that she just, just doesn't eat fish. So honestly, I don't feel like you need to, to take it just because you're not eating a lot of those fish products. Again, you could talk with your healthcare provider a little bit more carefully because they would know more about your medical history and if there is more of a reason for you to be taking them, but I, I don't have strong recommendations. <laughs> okay, the question is, um, take men taking uh, testosterone replacement and now the commercials on TV about is, that he's going to die. Well, I, I'm going to be flipped first and just say, well, you are going to die. We all are. <laughs> but I'm only 61. Okay. <laughs> um, there, I, I mean, it, it basically emphasizes the point that there's risk to any medication. Um, and, um, you know, there have been some increased risk of heart attack, et cetera, in, in men taking it. Hormones, not a surprise. We found the same thing in women when we were using estrogen for uh, menopausal symptoms routinely. Um, and, um, again, you have to weigh the risk versus the benefits. But the lawyers have, have found that now they have a way to make a little extra money. <laughs> Talk with your doctor. Yep. Make sure your cholesterol's in check okay. and that's being followed because okay. testosterone can raise te the cholesterol levels. Mm -hmm. If you're able to do some exercise, you know, incorporate exercise because those are things, keep your blood pressure controlled. So general things that we already know help lower your risk of heart disease. Just make sure that you're meeting those things. Back on the fish oil, uh, the impression I got was that the studies say that it really doesn't do much good for cholesterol, whether it's fish oil or flaxseed or whatever on that mega freeze. I've got a high triglycerides, and a doctor is essentially prescribing uh, fish oil. He said, use the over the counter and see if it goes down. But uh, uh, is, is that a different uh, process? And, so the question is, with back with the omega-3s and the effect on cholesterol, um, being prescribed some as the over-the-counter products for treating high triglycerides. So the information that's coming out there is, is 
changing over the last several years with cholesterol on lots of different aspects. We do have data to definitely show that triglycerides have lowered with the fish oil products. But the bigger question is now whether or not just lowering the triglycerides overall reduces your risk of heart disease. And so when they've looked at it kind of overall heart disease, overall risk of dying, that's where some of the data is showing it may not be as effective. But as Marnie has mentioned, there's a good mix of information out there. So depending on which clinical trial you look at, you can see what you're wanting to see. Exercise is more helpful. Exercise is always great. <laughs> All right, it looks like there are no more questions, so you'll get to go one to more. Or one more. All right. Sure, they also are on, uh, on the thumb drive. Um, in the, on the thumb drive, there's like three categories, and there's one that's supplementary um, that was just and was put on yesterday. Um, and it has uh, Dr. Fornash's slides. That yeah, blue sorry is hard about to read. that. It, it automatically changes with the web pages on there. <laughs> oh, yes. All right. Well, enjoy your break. All right. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you. Hopefully, that needs good news. <laughs>